It's Championship Sunday, and on today's episode, I'm going to be telling you how to make the last-minute decisions that you need to win here in Week 16 and walk away with your hand held high. We'll talk about last night's games, including some monster performances from guys who have been quiet for most of the season. I'll also give you some up-to-the-minute injury news on today's games, including DeMarco Murray, T.Y. Hilton, Peyton Manning, Julio Jones, LeGarrette Blunt, and many others. And last, I'll tell you about a few players who I really like and a couple of guys who I really don't like coming into Week 16. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I'm here every week to give you the news and advice that you need to win your fantasy football leagues. And guys, the first thing that I want to do today is start off by taking a look back at Saturday night's games. We had Philadelphia and Washington, and then we also had San Diego and San Francisco Two games that I did not expect to be very fantasy relevant, to be completely honest with you guys, but they ended up having a lot of fantasy production in them. We'll start off by taking a look at the first game that happened, Philadelphia and Washington. The Redskins actually prevailed in this one, 27-24, but... There was some nice fantasy production on the side of Philadelphia as well. Mark Sanchez, 374 yards, two touchdowns. He did throw an interception, and he also fumbled the ball. But, I mean, look, from a fantasy standpoint, that's a pretty darn good game for Mark Sanchez. Not bad at all. Um, We really can't really think that he is going to remain this team starter in 2015. But to be honest with you guys, he has actually played fairly well in this Chip Kelly system here in 2014, given the fact that he was pretty much brand new to it when he came over to the team. Didn't really have a lot of time to prepare before he got into the lineup. And man, He's really done fairly well, and and what's been interesting is that other players in the offense have still been relatively consistent as well. Um, Jeremy Macklin has been mostly better than he was on Saturday night. He only caught four patch, passes for 62 yards, uh, whereas Jordan Matthews, three catches for 58 yards. Not terrible numbers between the two of those guys, but not great numbers. Um, it was actually Riley Cooper, though, this week. Five catches, 53 yards, and caught both of Mark Sanchez's touchdowns that had the biggest game. I'm sure he wasn't in anybody's fantasy lineups this week, which is kind of frustrating. But another guy who had a huge game, team record breaking, Zach Ertz, 15 catches for 115 yards. He did not score a touchdown here, but 15 catches, guys. That was the type of performance that people were hoping for out of him earlier in the year when this guy was kind of a sleeper coming into the year at the tight end position. He really hasn't turned out to be much in terms of a fantasy producing tight end, but he has been decent for the Eagles as far as on the field. Um, I, I, one thing that I would say is that going into 2015, I do think Zach Ertz has to be up on your list a little bit higher, especially as some of these other guys get older, your Jason Wittens and um, even your your Martellus Bennett's and guys like that, Antonio Gates, obviously, guys that are getting a little bit older um, that maybe are going to lose a step here in the next year or two. I think Zach Ertz maybe moves up to be in the conversation to be drafted around those guys. Now, it's going to be interesting to see what happens as far as you know whether or not he can develop that type of chemistry with Nick Foles in 2015, but there's no question that Mark Sanchez trusts this guy. So if for whatever reason Nick Foles gets injured again or you know something happens where Mark Sanchez is this team starter next year, yeah, I think Zach Ertz has got to be a guy that you're looking at for fantasy purposes. Um, the other thing to consider too, if you're in a dynasty league and for whatever reason you have Mark Sanchez, and I, and I say for whatever reason because if you're in a dynasty league and Mark Sanchez is your long-term option at quarterback, you're probably in a bad situation. But what I will tell you is that I do think that Mark Sanchez is going to become a hot commodity this offseason, potentially for a trade or something like that. Um, if you know, if there's a team out there that's looking to rebuild 
or a team that's really looking for a viable backup quarterback. Somebody, you know, if, if you're looking at, you know, a Washington or something like that, or uh, I guess probably not Washington because they're inner division, but, you know, a younger quarterback who maybe is a little bit more athletic. Let's say like a San Francisco, uh, a Colin Kaepernick, for example. They, they might want to bring in somebody to actually compete with this guy for the job because, to be honest with you, Colin Kaepernick's been pretty disappointing in his short time as a San Francisco 49ers quarterback. Um, and it would be it would be probably in the team's best interest at some point to bring in somebody to give him some competition there in training camp. I would actually think Mark Sanchez would be a good option for the 49ers as somebody, you know, who came from that type, that area of the country. He was, you know, went to USC and that kind of thing. I kind of think he would fit well in San Francisco as far as, you know, like the just the general outlook on life that he has, I guess you could say. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Mark Sanchez. He'll probably still stick stick with Philadelphia as their backup quarterback, but uh, there could be some interesting trades this offseason that involve Sanchez, depending on how things go, or, or if there's an injury in the preseason or something like that, and a team needs to acquire a quarterback. I think Sanchez has played well enough, at least in this offense, that he could be considered for a trade next season. So let's talk now about the Washington side of the ball. Uh, Washington obviously did come out with the win. Robert Griffin III didn't play great, but he wasn't bad. 220 yards, no touchdowns. He did throw an interception, only ran for 11 yards, but he kept the team in the game, and that's really all that you can expect at this point. Um, obviously, he's been a huge disappointment this season, last year. I mean, it's it's not been good for RG3. So the fact that he was able to get a big win here in a divisional game against a team that really needed it. Philadelphia needed this win, and, and they were definitely trying. So the fact that RG3 was able to go out there and lead his team to a victory does say something about him. The other thing that I thought was a little bit interesting, Deshaun Jackson, four catches, 116 yards. Now, obviously, this was against his former team. He did some damage against them in their previous game as well. But uh, it's interesting to me that Deshaun Jackson seems to be by far the preferred target for RG3. Because this offense is is throwing the ball deep right now uh, to Deshaun Jackson. They gave him quite a few opportunities. He beat him deep once or twice in this one. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's nice to see that Deshaun Jackson is getting a little bit of attention from RG3. If you're in a Week 17 league where you actually play in Week 17, I think Deshaun Jackson is somebody you have to look at as being a wide receiver 2 or a flex option. Uh, I don't think I would push him all the way up to being a wide receiver 1, but he's still a solid player who has that deep threat ability and can always score score a touchdown. Excuse me. Uh, so then uh, we'll talk about running backs as well. Alfred Morris. 83 yards and a touchdown, nothing spectacular, solid fantasy performance from him, no receptions uh, as usual, the guy just doesn't catch passes, but the really disappointing thing, if you're an Alfred Morris owner, and, and this might come back to bite some people, I'm almost certain that it will, Darrell Young, two rushes, two yards, two touchdowns, a little Jerome Bettis stat line for him, he was at, at, in there at the goal line and got the ball out of the fullback position, basically on a dive twice, and that was really disappointing for Alfred Morris owners because obviously you hope that your running back gets those carries and he's able to get in there for one or two of those touchdowns. I mean, can you imagine Alfred Morris's numbers if he had 85 yards uh, with three touchdowns? I mean, that's a monster game. And we're, what we're talking about now is 83 yards and one touchdown. Uh, still a solid game, but really not that game-changing big performance that you would love to see out of your running back here in Week 16. So a little bit disappointing there out of Alfred Morris, but it's more this this Jay Gruden offense or, you know, I don't know what the hell they're doing out there in Washington. They're... They obviously don't care about us fantasy owners, I'll tell you that much, because they're making all these different moves and moving quarterbacks around and giving touchdowns to fullbacks, and it's been really tough to watch. It really, really has, but Alfred Morris has been about the only guy that's had any consistency this season, and even he's had some down games, so going into next season, I do think that especially in your PPR leagues, you have to bump this guy down. I don't know how many times we have to hear in the preseason yeah, he's catching more passes. He's he's going to be more involved in the passing game than he comes out and catches seven, eight passes on the year. It's it's just, who cares what they say about that? Don't fall for that crap. Until we see it on the field, I am not going to believe that Alfred Morris is going to catch any passes. And it's not that I don't think that he can, because it's not like he's these guys out, out at the running back position are going out there catching passes 30 yards down the field and running great routes. 
basically all they have to do is run out of the backfield, sell a block, and catch a pass one yard down the field. And that's not that difficult to do. I do think Alfred Morris has the ability to do that. It's just that these offenses that he's been in have not been predicated around getting him the ball in the passing game. So to me, Alfred Morris is somebody that I am definitely downgrading to being at least a mid-level RB2. I kind of have him ranked somewhere between 12th to 15th at running back for next season. I mean, obviously that's going to change a lot depending on how things go this offseason. But Alfred Morris has been disappointing for me as a fantasy owner this year. I had him in a PPR league, but it was it was a, it's a really weird scoring system where you get 10 points per rushing or receiving touchdown. And I expected this guy with RG3 at quarterback to put up big numbers this year in the touchdown category. And it's been a lot of this stuff with Darrell Young and uh, I forget who the hell else they had in there uh, that scored some touchdowns as well. But it's been super frustrating to own Alfred Morris from that standpoint. But um, like I said, next year, depending on how things go with that whole situation in Washington, I think that you kind of have to put him as a mid-level RB2 at this point, not a high-level RB2 or a low-level RB1 like he was coming into this season. So let's talk about the other game that happened. That was San Diego and San Francisco. San Diego went into San Francisco, got the 38-35 to victory. I wasn't expecting this game to be anywhere near as high scoring as it was, but we got some nice fantasy performances on both sides of the ball here. Basically, almost everybody that you would think about from a fantasy standpoint was relevant in this one. Uh, you had Keenan Allen out, which, you know, obviously he shouldn't have been in your lineup. If he was, you're just not paying attention. But everybody on the San Diego side of the ball pretty much did something. We had Phillip Rivers, 356 yards, four touchdowns. He did throw three interceptions, so that's pretty ugly. But overall, his game was very, very nice from a fantasy standpoint. We do not complain about 356 yard, four touchdown performances, even if they're associated with a three interception game. That is a great performance for Rivers, and it's a good way to end the season because this guy has been a very, very solid fantasy performer this year, and I, I want to make sure that people understand that this guy is a starter for next year over guys like Colin Kaepernick and guys like, you know, your Eli Mannings, all of these type of guys. You don't draft them above Phillip Rivers. Phillip Rivers is out there throwing the ball to Eddie Royal. 10 catches, 94 yards, and a touchdown. Antonio Gates, the ghost of Antonio Gates at this point. The guy's old. He's, he's decrepit. 7 catches, 92 yards, 2 touchdowns. Malcolm Floyd, a guy who's been up and down his entire career, who has all the talent in the world but has just never been able to put it together. 4 catches, 50 yards, and a touchdown in this one. Everybody performing for this team. And it's just, it's so funny that people just continue to disrespect Phillip Rivers because the guy has not had a viable number one wide receiver other than Vincent Jackson in years at this point. Um, everybody has been, and even Vincent Jackson was up and down. And it's not because of Phillip Rivers. Phillip Rivers gets the ball to all these other guys. He moves the ball around. He gets he finds his target for the week, and he just exploits and exploits and exploits it. So this guy is a money fantasy quarterback. I do love what he's given you this year. I mean, especially given his average draft position. He was not drafted as a starter in almost any league. So he has way outperformed his draft or his pre-draft ranking, I should say. So definitely like what he's doing. Eddie Royal, you're, you're just you can't really draft him, even though he, he did have the nice game here. Malcolm Floyd, another guy you can't really draft. You can play them based on matchups, and especially in situations like this where you've got a Keenan Allen out, but it's just, it's so hard to predict which one of them is going to do well, even when Keenan Allen's out. I mean, the fact that both of them had a nice game here is pretty rare. Most of the time, you're going to see one of them do well and one of them do absolutely nothing. And then Antonio Gates, obviously, um, the guy's been about as consistent as you're ever going to find at the tight end position from a fantasy standpoint. Seven catches, like I said, 92 yards, two touchdowns. If this is the end of Antonio Gates' career here down the stretch here in 2014, it's a great way to go out. I mean, the guy's going to be a Hall of Famer someday. I don't see how you could keep him out at this point. And as long as he is still playing, if he plays in 2015, he's got to be a starting fantasy tight end. We came into this year, a lot of us assuming Ladarius Green would take a bigger part of the offense here away from Gates, but it just hasn't been that way. It's been Gates all year. He's been very, very good from a fantasy standpoint. And I just have really nothing to complain about for Antonio Gates. He's outperformed his ADP as well. So you got to love that. And then on the other side of the football, 
Colin Kaepernick, one of the most disappointing players coming into the 2014 season. I mean, the guy was ranked really high in a lot of leagues. He was a top 10 quarterback in most leagues. A lot of people said that they thought he could be one of the guys that leads the league in rushing from a quarterback position. He hasn't even really come close this year, to be honest. But in this one, he definitely showed us that type of skill. Only 114 yards passing, which is an extraordinarily low number. I mean, this guy is just not throwing for any sort of yardage. Vernon Davis is completely fantasy irrelevant at this point in this offense. I'll tell you that much. Michael Crabtree is pretty much irrelevant as well. Uh, But Colin Kaepernick did throw the one touchdown, didn't throw an interception. But the big thing, 151 yards and a touchdown rushing. He had that 90-yard touchdown run. Now, he did fumble once, but you really have to question at this point. When you see Colin Kaepernick running the ball for 151 yards, and there were a couple plays where he broke off for big yardage on the ground. You have to ask, is the coaching staff holding this guy back? Because there's no question that the physical ability is there. But we have not seen him take off and run like we have Russell Wilson, even like we have Andrew Luck. I mean, the guy just doesn't take off and run like we expected him to. He's not Mike Vick. He's not, you know, a pure running quarterback. I understand that. But at the same time, the guy has the ability. The speed is there. The strength is there. The vision is there. The moves are there. Everything is there. And you just question at this point, Is Jim Harbaugh, are the rest of the coaching staff, are they telling him, don't run with the football, stand in the pocket? And I I know we've heard that about other guys as well. We've heard, you know, for quite a bit of time in Atlanta, Mike Vick, you need to not run around like a chicken with your head cut off. And then when they tried to do that, he wasn't nearly as successful. And same thing with RG3. They told him you can't run around. Now, obviously, RG3 had a lot of injury concerns, as did Mike Vick. But as soon as you start telling these guys who are naturally athletically gifted, and that's their big thing that made them what they are, that they can't run, what do you have? You have a guy who's a below average pocket passer, and that's what Colin Kaepernick has been this year. So it's been very, very frustrating, and as long as this coaching staff does remain in place, which we don't know that it will given the fact that they missed the playoffs this year and everything, um, as long as this coaching staff remains in place, though, Colin Kaepernick's a QB2 for 2015 at best. You know, he's he's um, he's somebody that you cannot draft as a fantasy starter at this point. He just isn't anywhere near as consistent as he should be. And unless he starts running the ball more, he will never be a fantasy relevant quarterback. It's just it, the, the pure passing ability just doesn't seem to be there. They have options in the passing game. Crabtree's been good. Anquan Bolden is a potential Hall of Fame receiver. I mean, the guy's put up huge numbers throughout his career. And you've got Vernon Davis, who's put up huge numbers at times. Why is he not throwing the ball to these guys? Why is he so incompetent at getting them the football? Are are all of his receivers bad? I just don't believe it. I'm not going to fall for that. I think that it's Kaepernick primarily, and it's the coaching staff. They just aren't playing. They're not calling the right plays for this guy. They're not setting up the offense in a way that could fit his specific skill set. And unless they do that, this team is going to struggle on offense. Now, Anquan Bolton did catch seven passes for 61 yards in this game. Nothing spectacular. Um, a solid day for him, but you know, from a, from a non PPR standpoint, that's a weak game. From a PPR standpoint, seven catches added to the 61 yards is it's acceptable. It's not great, but a little bit disappointing that he wasn't able to do a little bit more in a game that their team scored 35 points in. But a lot of that came from the fact that Frank Gore had such a huge game. With Carlos Hyde out, Frank Gore was given the ball 26 times, ran for 158 yards and a touchdown, including a 52-yard touchdown run. Now, Frank Gore is another guy who a lot of people are expecting to be kind of singing his swan song right now here at the end of his career. This could be the final season of Frank Gore's career. Another potential Hall of Famer in this game. Um, Frank Gore, big, big game. One of the biggest games that we've seen from him in quite some time. It was good to see him out there doing that. Now, I came into this game, I did not expect Frank Gore to do anything like this. They have not been running the ball effectively. The Chargers have been pretty good against the run for the most part. So it's hard to really expect that Gore is going to go out there and have a big game like this. So I understand he was on a lot of people's bench. But it's it's one of those things where... You can you can sit and you can predict and you can pro- prognosticate and you can, you know, go through every single nook and cranny on the information that you have. And then Frank Gore busts off a 52-yard run. And it's just you don't expect that kind of thing to happen out of a guy like that who hasn't shown that kind of explosiveness at all this season. So, you know, you, you, you get what you can out of a Frank Gore, but you don't expect it every week. Um, 
This guy is not going to put up another 150-yard game next week. I, I would be astonished if he did. So don't go out there and start thinking that you've got Frank Gore of 2006 on your team right now. You don't. He's not that guy anymore. And you just kind of need to take this game for what it is and, and not overthink it. Frank Gore is still a, an RB2 at best right now. Um, a low-end RB2 at that for the most part. And especially if Carlos Hyde comes back, I do expect him to touch the ball a couple of times here in the end of this season. All right, so let's move on now and talk about some of the injury updates that we have for the fantasy lineups today. We have DeMarco Murray versus the Indianapolis Colts who is currently listed as questionable. He's He injured his left hand last week late in the game against the Eagles. It will requ- it did require minor surgery, excuse me. And I, I will say that I did a previous show on this, a, a quick about 5 to 10 minute segment on why I believe that Joseph Randall is a huge pickup this week. At the time, it did not look like DeMarco Murray was going to play, and I still believe that Joseph Randall needs to be owned in all leagues right now, given the fact that DeMarco Murray might not play still. But I will say that all signs are pointing toward him playing, so I would go out there and make sure, obviously, if DeMarco Murray got dropped for some reason in your league based off the injury, go out there and pick him up. Don't let him sit on the waiver wire by any means. This guy should be owned in all leagues, of course, uh, the number one running back in the game right now. But I do think that if he's on the field, you have to start him against Indianapolis. They're not a great defense. They're not a bad defense, but the Cowboys are going to rely on DeMarco Murray. If he's healthy enough to play, they're going to have him on the field. Now, this is kind of an interesting situation because... Given the fact that Philadelphia lost, Dallas only has to win one of their next two games. Now, this one here this week is at home against Indianapolis. It's a hard game. Indianapolis is definitely one of the best teams in the league. This is one of the tougher games the Cowboys are going to play all year. And there is a thought that goes into this saying, look, this is a tough game anyway. Maybe we just kind of punt this one as far as DeMarco Murray goes. We hope that he's able to get healthy for next week's game, which is a little bit more reasonable of a win, I would say. It's against the Redskins. Now, it is in Washington, if I remember correctly. But even still, you have to probably think that there's at least some thought that goes into benching DeMarco Murray this week just so that they can get him back against Washington in in an easier-to-win game. Because if he gets re-injured here against the Colts, it is not going to be good for his chances to play down the stretch, even if the Cowboys do make the playoffs. So again, pay close attention to this one before kickoff. It does sound like he's going to play, but you never really know at this point what's going to happen. Next guy I want to talk about is Julio Jones. Now he is up against the New Orleans Saints today in what is a big game for the NFC South. This division is just a complete train wreck, but Julio Jones did take part in a walkthrough on Saturday, and his ability to play will be based on his pregame workout, just like it was last week when he did not play. So this one is going to be truly a game-time decision. I really can't give you much more information other than that the Falcons and Julio both seem optimistic that he will play today. So be on the lookout for that. Of course, we don't want to overthink things and bench Julio Jones for somebody who is not a good player. If he's healthy, he has to be in your lineup. If he's out there for the Falcons, he needs to be in your fantasy lineup. This is a good matchup for the Falcons. Um, The Saints are very, very bad against the pass. And the nice thing is, is that these guys play in an early game today. So you don't have to really think and pre-plan for the evening games or anything like that. Just pay attention to what happens prior to kickoff and we'll try our best to make Make sure that Julio Jones, if he's on the field, like I said, for the Falcons, that you get him into your lineup for your fantasy team. That needs to happen. Next guy, T.Y. Hilton at the Dallas Cowboys. Now, this one's a little bit different. He's questionable with a hamstring injury. The Colts' playoff berth is already secure. They won their division, which may cause them to sit T.Y. Hilton this week. Now, the one thing is that the Colts are behind both the Patriots and the Broncos for a first-round bye in the playoffs. Now, in in order for them to get it, they're a full full game behind both those teams. So in order for them to get it, they are going to need some help by the Patriots and the Broncos losing. And unfortunately, they won't know how those type how those games go until their game is over. So it's going to be a thing where my personal opinion is that I think you're going to end up seeing actually a um, you're going to see T. Y. Hilton probably sit out this game. But even if he does play, I do think that it's a hamstring injury that could get worse if he tweaks it. This is a risky play from a fantasy standpoint. Um, 
so you really have to consider the fact that given the fact that he could end up getting hurt again, he's he might not be the wisest guy to put into your lineup. The other thing too is that from an Indianapolis standpoint, if they hurt if Julio Jones gets hurt, or not Julio, excuse me, if TY Hilton gets hurt in this game, he's a speed first wide receiver. So even if he gets healthy and he's back in the playoffs, if he's got a lingering hamstring injury, that's just not good. I mean, to me, if I'm the Indianapolis Colts, I'm probably benching T.Y. Hilton today unless he's fully ready to go and, and isn't feeling any sort of tightness in his hamstring or anything like that. Because, like I said, if if he gets hurt again, this is a bad situation. And from your fantasy standpoint, if he does play today, I can understand wanting to put him into your lineup. But the unfortunate thing is that because he is a little bit hampered by this hamstring, he's a speed first wide receiver. And if, if, he, if he's not at full speed, how can you put him a high up on your rankings? I mean, it's not like he's a terrible player, if, even if he's a little bit slowed down, but he's certainly not the dynamic talent that he is, a, a wide receiver one capable player, if, he, if he's not healthy. So I move him down my rankings to about 20th at wide receiver this week, even if he does play, which means that there are a lot of guys out there that you could find to play in front of him. Um, obviously, you know, if you're in a 12 team league, he's probably a wide receiver too, but I don't think that he's a particularly great play this week. Next guy, Rashad Jennings, who will be at the St. Louis Rams or not. He's not going to play today, actually, guys. Looking to come back in week 17 against the Eagles, which means Andre Williams is going to be the starter again here. Now, Andre Williams has had a couple of nice games, but St. Louis's defense is very, very good. I would not risk starting him unless you're in a situation where you can start him as a flex or if you're in a desperate situation where if DeMarco Murray, for whatever reason, doesn't play and you've just got to put somebody in there. Andre Williams is going to get some carries, so he could sneak into the end zone. Could have a decent game today, but I don't love the high-end capability of Andre. Williams against the Rams. Next guy, Peyton Manning. Now, Peyton Manning is somebody that has been disappointing over the past couple of weeks. There's no question about it. Um, for the past four or five weeks here, he has not been producing the type of numbers that we expect out of Peyton Manning, but he is up against the Cincinnati Bengals today, and he is currently listed as questionable. Now, this doesn't really concern me that much because I think if Peyton Manning was not going to play, we would hear a lot more about it than we currently are. But it is some, somewhat interesting that he is listed as questionable. It'll be interesting to see how he ends up playing. The other thing to keep in mind is that he does have a wide receiver, Emmanuel Sanders, who has flu-like symptoms and is truly a game-time decision today. So from your fantasy standpoint, if you've got Emmanuel Sanders, you've got to pay close attention. Um, excuse me, these guys play on Monday night. So this is a tough situation if you own Emmanuel Sanders. You have to be careful. You cannot leave him in your lineup without a backup option. So if, for example, Emmanuel Sanders is is the one that you've got and you, you're pretty much going to play him, I would drop another receiver and go out there and pick up, say, a Wes Welker or something like that. Um, go out there and pick up if Mohamed Sanu, for whatever reason, is still available. Go out, go out there and pick up somebody that you can at least have as a warm body on the field for you in a situation where Emmanuel Sanders doesn't play. It's a big risk. I do think that it's going to be, like I said, a, a true game time decision. So we really can't imply whether he's going to play or not. But obviously, if Emmanuel Sanders plays, he's got to be in your lineup. Unfortunately, that doesn't help Peyton Manning's success. Uh, you can't bench Peyton Manning, obviously. The guy's, the guy's one of the best fantasy players football players ever to play the game of football truly like legitimately he's probably statistically the the highest scorer in the history of fantasy football I would assume so uh, you can't bench him obviously but you do look at this as being a tough matchup to be honest um obviously the Broncos have tons of firepower but with Peyton being a little bit hampered and Emmanuel Sanders being a little bit hurt and you question whether Julius Thomas is still fully healthy, all these type of things come into play and it hurts Peyton Manning's upside a little bit in this one. Obviously, you still play him though. Next guy, LeGarrette Blunt, will be at the New York Jets today. Downgraded to out. He is not going to play in today's game. Jonas Gray seems likely to get the majority of the carries. I like him as a low-end RB2 this week. The Jets are actually a solid run defense. They're a terrible pass defense, but the Patriots do run the football quite a bit at the goal line, so it would be not surprising to see him get into the end zone here. 
we of course always have to just guess on what's going to happen at the running back position. You could go out there and you could see, um, you know, a Shane Vereen or a Brandon Bolden get a bunch of carries or something like that. But it seems most likely that Jonas Gray is going to get the majority of the carries. So I would go out there and acquire him if you're a LeGarrette Blunt owner and you were expecting to have him in your lineup. Next guy in the same game, Julian Edelman did not travel with the New England Patriots, so he will also miss the game against the Jets. I think that upgrades your Rob Gronkowski a little bit. I think it upgrades your Brandon LaFell a little bit, but everybody other than that I think is pretty much unaffected by it. You don't bench Brady or anything like that because Edelman isn't playing. He's still, Brady's still Brady. You got to have him in your lineup. And then the last guy that I wanted to bring up, Andre Johnson against the Ravens today. He is expected to be back. He did miss last week with a concussion, but... But Andre Johnson against the Ravens is actually a solid matchup here. I think that this will help the Texans offense overall. I think that it gives Arian Foster a slight boost because I think that they're going to be able to move the ball more effectively, get him into the red zone more often. And I do think that it's actually slightly going to help DeAndre Hopkins as well. Hopkins is not still, in my opinion, a guy who can be that wide receiver one without another option on the field to pull away a little bit of the the pressure off of him. So it'll be nice to have Andre Johnson back. I think you got to start both Hopkins and Johnson this week against a very, very porous Baltimore Ravens secondary. So that is going to do it for the injury updates. Now I want to give you guys a couple other things here that will help you today going into the games. These are my busts and sleepers of the week. We're going to start off with my busts. And a bust doesn't necessarily mean that you have to bench these guys. But they're guys that I think are kind of being overrated and guys that I would consider looking elsewhere on my fantasy team if I have them. You have to look and see if there's anybody that's comparable, of course, on your roster. But a couple of these guys are normally starters, and I would probably say that for the most part, they should not be starters today uh, if you have decent enough options to back them up. First one is going to be Josh Gordon, who is going up against the Carolina Panthers today in Carolina, and this one is going to be tough. Um... It'd be hard for Johnny Manziel to be any worse than he was last week, but this is still not a good situation. Josh Gordon has only five catches for 63 yards over his past two games. He hasn't scored since coming back from the suspension. And the Panthers have only given up five wide receiver touchdowns over their past seven games combined. So this isn't a particularly great matchup for him anyway. I think Josh Gordon is going to do better than he did last week, but I still don't love him as being a wide receiver one, and I kind of am not necessarily too sold on him as being a high-end wide receiver two either. I have him ranked about 15th this week at wide receiver, which is definitely the lowest we've had him at since he's come back. Johnny Manziel just doesn't look like he's ready to play yet, and of course, we could be completely wrong on that. He could just come out and have a monster game, but at this point, he doesn't really look ready, and it's hard to trust any of his receivers. The other one, Giovanni Bernard against the Denver Broncos. Now, the Broncos are a solid defense against the run. They've actually given up the fewest rushing yards in the league this season. Giovanni Bernard's a dynamic talent. I think in PPR leagues, you could consider putting him in it as an RB2, but I don't think that I want him as an RB2 and especially not as an RB1 against this defense given the fact that he is kind of the backup running back right now behind Jeremy Hill. Jeremy Hill's getting the majority of the carries. He's getting about 70% of the carries, whereas Giovanni Bernard's getting about 25% to 30% of the carries, and especially at the goal line. Jeremy Hill's getting the majority of the work there, which means that Giovanni Bernard's upside is pretty well capped at, you know, 50 yards or so, unless he breaks away a run. So it's a very frustrating thing if you're a Giovanni Bernard owner, because in early in the year, he looked like he was a stud. And then he got hurt, and it's never really been the same ever since. So I'm probably benching Giovanni Bernard in most of my leagues this week that I have him still in. Sleepers for the week, and these are guys that are maybe not normally in your lineup, but definitely guys that should be in your lineup. Uh, We're going to start off at the quarterback position, and I don't necessarily actually think this one is a sleeper, but um, I've seen a couple people saying that they're benching him, and I don't understand why. I'm just baffled by it, and that's Matt Ryan against the New Orleans Saints. They're in New Orleans, but Matt Ryan has three straight 300-yard games. He has eight touchdowns and only three picks over that stretch. He absolutely murdered the Saints for 448 yards and three touchdowns back in week one. 
Julio Jones should be back this week. Harry Douglas looks good. Roddy White looks good. This whole passing game is just tearing it up. It's unfortunate that they weren't able to do this early in the year, but Matt Ryan has been a stud quarterback over the past three, four weeks. So you got to have him in your lineup. I think that he is a top five option at quarterback this week. Definitely want him in my lineup. The next guy, Kenny Stills, on the opposite side of the ball in that same game for the New Orleans Saints up against the Falcons. He's been a top 20 wide receiver since Brandon Cooks got hurt pretty quietly, but he's actually led the Saints in reception since that point as well. So this is still a pass first offense. I do like Kenny Stills. Atlanta is horrible against the pass. They've given up more yards to opposing wide receivers this season than any team in the entire league. New Orleans needs this win if they want to win this division. So I do think that they're going to try and get the ball out there to Kenny Stills. Big play wide receiver could beat them deep uh, once or twice even in this game. I think that I like him as a wide receiver too here and definitely somebody who you could have in your lineup here in the championship weeks. Trey Mason against the New York Giants. Now, Trey Mason has been significantly better at home than he has been away this season, which is, you know, it's not that surprising, but the the splits are pretty significant here. Now, he did have a horrible game against the Cardinals this past week where he ran for, you know, 33 yards or something like that, if I remember correctly. But Arizona is an elite defense, guys. These guys, their defense has carried them all season, despite the fact that they've had awful offensive performances. Arizona is still in line to get a first round bye in the playoffs this year in the NFC to win that division and everything like that. So I'm not a big fan of uh, Trey Mason running against them last week, but this week he has a significantly better matchup against the Giants. The Giants are just terrible overall. They've given up the most yards per carry in the league this season. And Trey Mason, despite the fact that he's not super physically talented, he's had good games. So you can't deny the fact that the guy has had production, and I do think that he is somebody that I would put in there as an RB2 here in Week 16. Next, we've got Fred Jackson up against the Oakland Raiders in Oakland. Now, I especially like Fred Jackson for PPR leagues. He's getting targeted a ton in this Buffalo Bills offense with Kyle Orton at quarterback. He's had 70-plus yards or a touchdown in, in each of his past four games since coming back from the injury. Now, that doesn't really sound like anything spectacular, but it's decent consistency out of a guy who uh, really has split carries, and it's been a pretty disappointing year on offense for the Bills. So the fact that Fred Jackson has done well against good defenses, I don't mind that. I I definitely think that against the Raiders, we could certainly see some nice performances here. Uh, The Raiders have given up the second most touchdowns to opposing running backs on the season. They've given up the second most fantasy points per game to running backs on the season. And despite the fact that C.J. Spiller is expected to be back, I'm not worried about that. I think Fred Jackson continues to get the vast majority of the touches here out of this backfield, and I would not be surprised to see him finish as an RB1 this week in fantasy football. Another guy at the running back position that I like, Matt Asiata of the Minnesota Vikings. He is up against the Miami Dolphins in Miami. Now, the Dolphins have given up an average of 153 yards rushing per game over their past four contests. Not good. That is not good. Matt Asiata has touched the ball 18 plus times in three straight games, and those have come against good defenses, So, or at least good run defenses. So I think that there's a good opportunity that Matt Asiata touches the ball 15 to 20 times in this one, and if he does, I think he's a good bet to have a solid fantasy day. I seriously think that you should consider him if you're looking for a guy to put in there as a flex or as a low-end RB2. Matt Asiata has got some decent upside here, and he should touch the ball plenty in this one. Last guy on the list today, before we wrap up the show, Dante Moncrief. Now, I missed on this one last week, but in my defense, Roddy White, or not Roddy White, Reggie Wayne did play, and uh, T.Y. Hilton did play as well. So it's a little bit interesting to me that Dante Moncrief didn't do better last week, but I am still on board with him this week. I think that T.Y. Hilton is not going to play today. So given that fact, and Reggie Wayne's still limited, I do think that Moncrief could end up being the wide receiver one today for the Indianapolis Colts as they go up against the Cowboys. The Cowboys have given up an average of 22 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers over their past eight games. So this is a long stretch of them doing very, very poor against opposing wide receivers. So I think that Moncrief has a good chance of having a solid game here. They're giving up a ton of yardage as well, guys. Catches, yardage, just everything. Touchdowns. The Cowboys have been awful in their second 
secondary through the second half of the season. So definitely like everybody really against this Cowboys secondary and especially a guy like Moncrief who has shown that he has some decent potential and he's got Andrew Luck throwing him the ball as well. The other thing I also like Dwayne Allen and Kobe Fleener today if you're looking for some sleeper tight ends both of those guys could get into the end zone the Cowboys have been atrocious against opposing tight ends all season long so definitely get both of those guys into your lineup if you're looking for a tight end this week. So that is going to do it for today's show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. If you did, please make sure to give this video the thumbs up, and also click the subscribe button below so that you can be updated when I put out the next episode. If you guys have any questions about your lineup for today, make sure that you leave it in the comments section below or tweet it to at ClickwoodTV. I'll do my best to answer them before game time. Thanks again, guys. Good luck this week, and I'll see you guys next time here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Oh, 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 oh,